Okay, so I think we can go ahead and start and the meeting will be recorded. It's with me. Natasha, is it over to me? Not yet. Wiping is going to just start out and then it'll be over to you. Great. Thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah. Jennifer, thank you. And Nick. Uh, so let's start. Uh, hello, everyone. I warmly welcome you all uh, from Canada, USA, UK, and in particularly colleagues from China and Japan because it's midnight there. Uh, to the third talk of the Distinguished Lecture Series hosted by the One Health Modeling Network for Emerging Infections. So my name is Huai Ping, and I'm the PI and one of the co-directors of Omni Reuni Network, and I will be moderating the lecture today. Uh, we would like to acknowledge and recognize the indigenous land we are standing on before we start. As I'm joining from York University, I will read the university's land acknowledgement. We acknowledge the land the Omni Reuni Network's head office is located on. York University recognizes that many indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many indigenous nations. The area known as Tecoronto has been take, uh, caretaken by the Anish Back Nation, the Hard No Shawnee Confederacy, and the Yurong Wendat. It is now the home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Medis communities. We, re we acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the dish with one spoon, one palm belt covenant in agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. We are very grateful <clears throat> to have you join us today, Dr. Nick Ogden, to deliver a lecture on modeling to support public health decisions for responding to emerging infectious diseases, along with our opening remarks by Dr. Jennifer Steve. Before we start the presentation, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce you, my fellow co-directors, Dr. Mark Lewis at the University of Victoria, also Dr. Elaine Cahaban at the University of Montreal. Additionally, York University has been a strong supporter of Omni Reuni, hosting the network through the Canadian Center of Disease Modeling. And building a, now is building a new Omni Research Lab at York University, which is set to open in this spring. So with that, please welcome our esteemed guest who will be who will give us the opening remark. So York University Associate Vice President of Research, Dr. Jennifer uh, Steve. So Dr. Steve, who is also a professor in the Department of Physiology, uh, Psychology in the Faculty of Health, is a member of the Center for Vision Research and holds a tier one York Research Chair. Prior to her current role, Professor Steve has held various leadership positions, including the Associate Dean of Research and Graduate Education of the Faculty of Science. Uh, thank you for being with us today, Dr. Steve. Uh, wel welcome. Thank you, Dr. Xu. Good morning to everyone, and I understand that I should also be saying good evening to many as well. I am very honored to be here to open the Omni Reuni lecture series today. The topic of today's seminar is significant to all, given the world's events in the past three years. 
Today's lecture is titled Modeling for Supporting Public Health Decisions About Emerging Infect Infectious Diseases. And a lot has been learned in the past three years through scientific research, as we have had to constantly adjust to changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic and emergence and re-emergence re of infectious diseases. As scientific knowledge has evolved, so have our responses to the pandemic, as well as our understanding of the importance of making informed decisions to support public health. In higher education, we have relied very heavily on public health guidance that is shaped by modern infectious disease modeling. Despite a time of great uncertainty, our policymakers worldwide have been informed by the diligent research and work of scientists in the field. At York University, we are highly focused on research collaboration and building partnerships nationally and globally. We are very fortunate to have some of this expertise in-house here at York, including our moderator today, Professor Huai Ping Xu. Professor Xu leads the One Health Modeling Network, focusing on the connections between environmental and human health to refine disease modeling and works towards building a sustainable and active modeling network that enhances Canada's early detection, warning and response to emerging infectious diseases. And a One Health data portal to support and rapidly respond to current emerging threats of public health concern. Hosted at York University, Omni Reuni was awarded $2.5 million to be part of the broader Emerging Infectious Disease Modeling Initiative established between the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada. This initiative has been especially important because it established multidisciplinary networks of specialists across our country to work with the public sector. Therefore, this work is not possible without acknowledging the critical role of government agencies and partnerships in combating the pandemic and other emerging diseases. We know that building a better future depends on our ability to work together. Lectures like these are highly important for knowledge sharing, especially as they draw together a network of members from 23 in academic institutions from coast to coast across Canada and collaborators from over 28 national and international organizations. We look forward to hearing uh, today's speaker, Dr. Nick Ogden, to hear more about his work and modeling that supports the public health decisions that he is uh, being made with respect to emerging effect infectious diseases. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today and thank you again for your commitment to the future of public health. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your address, Dr. Steve. Uh, we are so pleased to have you here today. Uh, now let's dive into the lecture. I'd like to kindly ask that your microphones remain off during the lecture. Afterwards, we will have question and answer session. You will be able to ask questions and please also type your questions into the chat. Today, we are so pleased to have renowned researcher, Dr. Nick Ogden here to present the distinguished lecture. Dr. Ogden is a UK trained veterinarian with a doctorate in wet bond diseases ecology and postdoctoral training in disease modeling. He's a senior res researcher, scientist, research scientist, and the director of public health risk science division within the National Microbiology Laboratory of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Normally focusing on accessing the disease risk through the study of ecology, epidemiology, and the genetic diversity of vectors, and zoonotic and vector-bound microorganisms. A key component of his work is assessing the impact of climate change on zoonosis and the wet bond diseases and developing tools for public health adaptation. Most recently, he has led PHAC's Public Health Agency of Canada's COVID-19 modeling 
and the emerging science teams. He is also a long-term collaborator of our Center for Disease Modeling at York, also a friend of mine I, res I highly uh, respect. Thank you for being here today, Dr. Ogden, please. Thank you very much. I will hopefully share my screen and uh, presentation. And uh, let me know if this is working. Yes, it's working. Do you see that? Do you see that in the full screen? Yes, we do. Okay, excellent. Thanks. All right. Well, thanks for those kind words, um, uh, 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 Wiping. Uh, it's uh, a pleasure to be here and to speak to you. I see there are many members of my team. You mentioned sort of uh, my role in modeling um, and uh, uh, my role now in modeling is very minor and my team's role is very major and has been through the pandemic. Um, and uh, uh, thanks to uh, Vice Dean uh, for, for uh, co uh, kind comments and identifying the importance of uh, the, the collaboration. Um, and the collaboration that has been going on now, as Huiping mentioned, for quite some time, for uh, heading for decades now uh, in the infectious disease uh, modeling world. So I'm going to talk about public health decisions and modeling, how modeling has supported those decisions uh, in terms of emerging infectious diseases, but also um, uh, somewhat uh, in the field of, uh, of the kind of more endemic diseases as well. So just a little introduction to get us grounded in what- uh, Nick, Nick, yes? it's not, I do not see full screen. Oh, is it? Just hold on a moment. Also, the same the slide is okay. Now it's full screen. Yeah. Okay. That's what, okay, what I, I wondered. So sometimes it 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 goes straight to full screen, and sometimes it doesn't. So it's a bit of a bit of a a, a bit of a lottery sometimes with uh, Zoom. So uh, thanks for pointing that out. Okay. So um, how do diseases emerge? Well, they emerge sometimes by awareness. In other words, we start to be able to detect them, but they emerge by a number of uh, of kind of biological uh, and human um, agency methods. The first of those is the kind of importation of a, uh, uh, an exotic pathogen uh, into a new environment, as we saw with West Nile virus. There's the geographic spread from one uh, an, an endemic area into a neighboring area where it's it hasn't been seen before. And we've seen that with Lyme disease and rabies, raccoon rabies. There's the ecological and environmental changes that cause an endemic disease to increase in abundance and transmission, which is the kind of re-emergence, or particularly for zoonoses, the spillover from uh, animals into humans, as we've seen with COVID. Well, there's a bit of argument about that, obviously, but uh, uh, um, uh, we still think that that is probably likely. And lastly, true emergence, evolution, fixation of new pathogenic variants of a an existing bug that was previously uh, uh, relatively benign. Of course, most emerging infectious diseases are zoonoses uh, or were zoonoses originally. And zoonoses are come uh, in a variety of, uh, of forms. The first is the zoonosis, which remains a zoonosis. And by and large, uh, that's what we see with West Nile virus where there is, uh, there is no human to human transmission, except perhaps by uh, um, uh, uh, blood transfusion. But by and large, there is no, it, it, all infections are caused by uh, uh, diseases transmitted from infected birds. Then we have those that are like MERS coronavirus, where people acquire infection from the uh, uh, animal reservoirs. And there is some human to human transmission but it's not efficient enough to, for it to be maintained. In other words, R0 is below one. And then there are those like the, uh, the, the SARS-CoVs and the uh, some influenza viruses, which come from animals, spill over from animals into humans. But once they get there, the, the pathogen is already capable of being transmitted human to human. And then you end up with um, 
uh, with, uh, with an epidemic in humans without the participation of animals. The drivers for disease emergence are kind of those of the uh, Anthropocene, the changes to climate, changes to land use, changes to biodiversity, uh, the uh, juxtaposition of, of now of increasingly of livestock with uh, wildlife, with um, uh, connectivity, creation of megacities, socioeconomic changes, and a globally connected world that together provides a great environment for the emergence, spillover and geographic spread of, of infectious diseases, as we have seen so clearly with COVID-19. This is a One Health issue. The interaction of human, animal, and environment uh, in this whole process of disease emergence is clear. And in order to understand it and to intervene appropriately, then we have to apply a, a One Health lens. As we have now over 20 years with the uh, uh, Faculté de Médecine Veterinaire, and um, uh, clearly this is uh, a, a, a good environment within the Omni Reuni uh, to be talking about One Health. I'll talk more about climate change. Climate change is clearly the biggest impact, environmental change that is, is uh, before us right now. So what decisions need to be made for public health? Well, there are two tracks of, of kind of decision making. Firstly, there are those in the outbreak response when you've got a big uh, 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 crisis to deal with, as we have with COVID. But there's also the preparedness, um, understanding risk, doing quantitative uh, uh, um, modeling, uh, doing projections, modeling that project what might happen in the future that allow us to put in place uh, surveillance um, and uh, uh, foresight uh, that will allow us to detect disease emergence early, intervene early, and hopefully be, be better at preventing disease. In times of crisis, we have a number of, uh, of, of, of modeling objectives, um, including importation modeling, understanding where and when and how many cases are coming into, into Canada. Initially, detecting how big the, uh, the, an outbreak or epidemic may be uh, and identifying at risk populations in terms of geography and vulnerability assessing effectiveness of interventions um, and adding value to the surveillance once the disease is, uh, once the epidemic is underway. Um, uh, so estimating the RT, um, uh, short and long range forecasts based on cases, hospitalizations, wastewater, et cetera. In COVID-19, we had to set up models uh, on the right at the start uh, of the of the epidemic, and during that process, we've set up four models: the initial, and they're all SEIR um, uh, models. Or actually, five models. We have an importation model as well, which I don't mention here. Um, but the four SEIR type models. The first was an, a very simple analytical model, um, which was very useful though for explaining to um, uh, non-experts what the um, uh, the uh, uh, what models do and what are potential uh, uh, consequences of the uh, of the of the pandemic. Then we had a, a, an R based SEIR model, um, uh, a, um, a a model developed by um, in collaboration with McMaster, um, and an agent based model um, uh, which is much more highly parameterized than than the other models. One thing that's significant about those these models, though, is that they are modeling reality. They are not theoretical models. They are aimed to find what will happen if, uh, if A, B, C, or D happens in a real world. They're informed by uh, largely the or parameters uh, are, are informed by the daily literature scans provided by our knowledge synthesis team, uh, which allowed the models to be uh, to have kind of real estimates of the duration of infectivity, the pre-symptomatic period, um, the uh, effectiveness of vaccines, the virulence of, uh, of variants. And for those, uh, as many of you will be familiar, for those uh, parameters that we cannot obtain from the literature, we obtain 
but from from fitting to data, which we've had um, uh, at least a reasonable amount of data during the, the pandemic. The first um, objective was to say, well, how big might this be um, under certain circumstances? And this came from this figure came from a presentation uh, that Dr. Tan gave in April uh, 2020, uh, which was um, uh, after we had really uh, had pause to, uh, to, to understand what the consequences are of an emerging infectious disease that is highly transmissible in a population that is entirely naive against which we have no uh, effective uh, vaccines or uh, um, uh, or therapeutics, which might kill one in a hundred and put uh, one in ten in hospital, and that was the challenge before us. Obviously, as at that point, there was um, a, a, the implementation of restrictive uh, public health measures uh, to to kind of try and pause uh, transmission until we had some idea of what. Uh, where we were in terms of incidents from surveillance and then uh, putting in place alternative uh, methods of, of control. And uh, the second real task for us was to assess to what extent case detection, and isolation, contact tracing and quarantine uh, uh, layered with other um, uh, measures such as phys physical distancing might allow uh, restrictions to be lifted yet maintain the um, uh, the, uh, uh, the the epidemic under control. We did this with our own models. We did this in collaboration with uh, uh, with with a number of university uh, colleagues um, uh, at York and elsewhere. Um, and um, and clearly, the concern was that if we lift the the restrictions in a population that is still remains naive, then the epidemic will just come back if we're not able to to um, uh, uh, use the alternative methods. Um, so we looked at the individual effects of, of contact tracing and, uh, sorry, uh, case detection and uh, 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 contact tracing uh, and uh, isolation of the former, quarantine of the, of the latter. Um, and, um, and essentially, there has to be a lot and it has to happen fast, too. In other words, you have to be on catching cases, catching a high proportion of the cases and um, uh, and doing it quickly. It raised the question um, as to uh, whether ultimately uh, contact tracing uh, and case detection were able to um, uh, control the infection, but maybe uh, if it was rigorous enough with enhanced um, uh, um, uh, uh, other measures such as, uh, uh, as, as distancing and so on, perhaps it could have done um, uh, um, we also looked at if you're going to open up what might uh, be the most risky places to, to open up. All of this provided uh, advice to senior managers. We also looked at what would happen, how, what's the best way to manage uh, the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the reintroduction of, uh, of restrictive measures if though that test and trace and other measures aren't capable of, of controlling uh, the transmission and the recommendations were to do it shut down early as soon as you see uh, um, uh, um, the uh, the disease emerging. Um, uh, I think it was Amy Herford, her work on the right hand side said uh, don't hesitate, re-escalate. Uh, to what extent this information was taken on board is not clear, but uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, the clearly what we actually saw was that reintroduction of uh, of restrictions really was done on the basis of hospital capacity rather than seeing things start to increase. We had importation model. Um, uh, which uh, evolved over time from just looking at importation of cases to imp importation of individual uh, um, individual uh, uh, variants, and uh, uh, a publication on that model is uh, is in, uh, in in prep at present. We also 
uh, uh, were conducting uh, studies that uh, that, that uh, really kind of early warning uh, uh, analysis and forecasting, uh, which include the, the short range uh, statistical forecasting, the long range uh, forecasting developed in uh, by SFU and by um, uh, 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 as I mentioned, in collaboration with McMaster, um, and the um, uh, obviously undertaking RT as many uh, or estimating RT nationally and and, uh, and provincially, and also uh, working with uh, a NATO Osgood's team uh, in, in in Saskatoon to use their particle filtering model for a short a short range um, uh, forecasting, essentially. Um, Clearly, the, the the these methods were very accurate. Um, there was there were many questions when uh, some of the forecasts were made, but they then uh, forecasts turned into reality, and uh, and enhancing the recognition amongst um, the uh, uh, many of the um, uh, of of our senior managers. As to the the, uh, the the effectiveness of the modeling, then as the vaccines appeared, our next task was to model what, um, if given potential effectiveness of the vaccines and a projected rollout and uptake of vaccines, and accounting for the complexities of emerging uh, uh, um, variants, what. Um, uh, when can we open up? Can, when can do we have enough of the population essentially immune or at least protected from severe outcomes that would allow us to to um, uh, to, to lift restrictions? And this is the kind of output that we were obtaining. This is from the agent based model, looking at loads of different uh, scenarios for vaccination coverage and uh, vaccine effectiveness. Um, um, and this was the outcome that uh, essentially we thought when we did the work uh, earlier on in 2021, that we may be able to open up end of summer, early uh, October, uh, sorry, early uh, fall, recognizing that, uh, that if uh, immune escape variants appeared or a more virulent um, uh, or more transmissible variant occurred, then you have to have a higher proportion of the population vaccinated and immune. And of course, lo and behold, we had Delta, which was more transmissible and more virulent, meaning that you have to have more people uh, uh, vaccinated. Lastly, we've used modeling uh, to um, uh, uh, do counterfactual an analysis and to see um, how we fared. Uh, we recognize that the epidemic, uh, the, the pandemic has been a, a pretty terrible thing for us and for many people in Canada. Um, uh, but this study really showed that the um, uh, that the outcome and the modeling was done by Vicky Ng, um, the, that the outcome was uh, uh, a lot better than may have been the case. Uh, uh, just to remind folk how really bad uh, uh, this it, disease could have been in a uh, in in a naive population, uh, and we did comparatively well compared to many other equivalent countries, at least uh, looking at uh, what um, in terms of, of deaths. It's not to say that we managed it perfectly, but we certainly uh, did do a, uh, a, a reasonable job. And I hope I like to think that the modeling that we did at, on our own in collaboration and the modeling that was done by our uh, people in universities and provinces across the country contributed to that uh, um, uh, to, to that outcome. We have been modeling for quite a long time, though, um, mostly in this peacetime non-crisis context. Um, and modeling in this circumstances has been used to provide quantitative risk assessments. If this thing happened, how bad could it be? A lot of it is in the pre-detection of disease emergence, identifying where and when diseases may emerge, and particularly in the context of climate change. We have been using the uh, importation model, uh, for example, seeing what might happen, you know, how many cases of Ebola from, uh, from, from West Africa might emerge uh, uh, or appear in Canada as a consequence of um, of the uh, uh, the the, um, 
uh, of epidemics occurring uh, there, or, and uh, also um, uh, similar um, importation uh, estimates from, from other outbreaks globally. Identifying at risk populations in terms of geography and population vulnerabilities, um, again, assessing effectiveness of intervention types, and more recently, we're gi giving thought towards um, uh, the um, uh, application of modeling skills to adding value to surveillance in terms of short term forecasts and for short and long range forecasts uh, based on uh, on surveillance data, which has not been done routinely uh, in, in, in most circumstances. Clearly, climate change adaptation uh, or adaptation to climate change is a big driver for a lot of the work that uh, we've done in the past and will be in the future. Um, uh, and this is taking into account all of the uh, aspects of risk from emerging and re-emerging infectious diseases, including the impact of climate change on the hazard in the environment, vectors, uh, pathogen, uh, reservoir hosts, the impacts on the contact rate between people and that hazard and the sensitivity of the populations to that um, uh, to that risk. Clearly, modeling is a good, uh, a, a, an excellent tool for approaching this because it is inherently synthetic. This is a kind of laundry list of what we need for climate change adaptation based on our own uh, 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 climate change and health assessments and those uh, conducted in the US and by uh, uh, the UN IPCC. And to, right at the top of that is assessing the risk, which is essentially modeling what might happen, which underpins our understanding of, of what might come and get us, uh, and then um, what surveillance we need to put in place, and uh, as a consequence, what adaptation tools we need to, to develop in order to uh, enhance our capacity to, to respond to, to risks and protect the public. We also need research, and we need a one health lens to that. So um, mathematical modeling, as I mentioned, is inherently synthetic, as long as we have the data enough, but it, it's capable of bringing together all of those, uh, the, the, the impacts of, uh, of reservoir host dynamics, for example, in wildlife, agricultural dynamics, vector, arthropod vector dynamics, transmission dynamics, how the pathogens behave, and also uh, what's happening in people, and also overlaying that with the climate drivers, which might be affecting all of those factors. Um, an example is the, uh, uh, the uh, life cycle of the Lyme disease vector, uh, Ixodes scapularis, dependent on temperature, host densities, um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, clearly, the need to bring all of those things together to understand what um, conditions are needed for tick populations to survive. Uh, in, in the um, early 2000s, this tick did not occur in Canada for the most part, but we wanted to know when and where it could occur uh, uh, with, a, with a warming climate. And beyond uh, the uh, reaching thresholds for the tick to, to actually be able to set up home in Canada, um, what might happen in terms of the abundance of ticks above that temperature. And a number of studies have been done initially uh, with Université de Montréal, then uh, uh, with uh, York University and also with St. Francis Xavier University, um, uh, producing essentially a kind of a multi-model approach, uh, but um, uh, essentially producing uh, uh, saying a consistent story, which um, uh, we have then gone out and validated with surveillance and is now highly validated. It has shown that um, uh, the, um, well, as well as detecting the emergence of, of Lyme disease and allowing attribution of the emergence of Lyme disease in Canada to climate change, it's also shown that the modeling was pretty accurate. And again, giving confidence both for, for ourselves and for others in the, in, in the uh, effectiveness of, uh, of using modeling to support uh, public health decisions. As we know, Lyme disease has emerged and we can track it with surveillance, but the surveillance was set up because of the kind of early warning that modeling uh, provided, and as well as the other aspects of trying to limit cases by informing the public uh, uh, how to, um, 
uh, protect themselves and also uh, protect uh, providing information for uh, uh, medical practitioners. Same methods are being applied to other emerging ticks or ticks that may emerge with climate change. This one, the uh, Lone Star tick, uh, which is uh, marching north towards us as well. Um, uh, and we're also developing models uh, to model the spread, the geographic spread once uh, uh, diseases are within Canada or close to our borders. Um, applying to other vector-borne diseases, um, uh, uh, in this case, the um, uh, chikungunya transmission, and uh, we're looking at other exotic vector-borne diseases as well, which now may well uh, uh, be able to get here um, and survive here. Um, and um, we're also modeling uh, uh, the uh, risk of, uh, uh, from foodborne illness, and the impact of climate change on risk from full foodborne illness in the farm to fork continuum. And also layered onto that, the um, antimicrobial resistance in the pathogens that may be, um, uh, that, that are uh, 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 being uh, transmitted in that continuum from, from, from uh, farm to fork. In terms of, uh, of uh, uh, applying uh, techniques and methods learnt during COVID to um, uh, the more uh, endemic diseases, we are uh, leveraging what we've done uh, to the seasonal acute uh, respiratory infections, looking at being able to estimate RT and forecast incidence. Um, and, uh, and that's both from uh, surveillance for human cases, but also uh, increasingly from wastewater, which is turning out to be quite a useful tool uh, for, for this purpose. And as uh, we know, we many will know, we have developed uh, models um, that are capable of, uh, of projecting cases based on the wastewater signal. If we don't have the detail, well, of, of you know the, the 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 transmission, the reservoir hosts, how the vectors behave, and so on. Well, from surveillance uh, data, we can use these combined GIS uh, 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 pattern matching, statistical machine learning, niche modeling approaches, um, and particularly if we combine with GIS to uh, ascribe to surveillance data. Um, uh, attributes of the environment in that uh, place, which can be used to uh, understand the relationship between the occurrence of a uh, of risk and the uh, uh, and, and the environmental and socio-economic environment in which they're occurring. And we've used these approaches to uh, uh, identify where the uh, uh, ED species vectors of dengue and Zika, chikungunya may occur uh, in the future in Canada. Um, and, um, uh, and we're applying it in, in other uh, fields as well. Um, many of the projects that we're doing are uh, uh, very long, complex and costly. And in order to uh, uh, prioritize the uh, our resources, which is taxpayers' resources from our point of view, to uh, these um, uh, um, uh, particular diseases. We've developed uh, uh, multi-criteria methods to do that, and these are being ap uh, applied in a number of contexts in order to, to prioritise. But I think we need to do that in order to justify, uh, in an open and transparent way, why we are selecting to do work on X instead of Y. In developing the public health tools for um, uh, uh, for uh, uh, to actually reduce the impact once diseases are endemic, uh, then again, modeling has a place, particularly, I think, in the um, uh, forecasting uh, uh, diseases such as uh, West Nile virus. It's still a research project. We have worked with um, uh, with many colleagues on this in, in universities and will continue to do so. But it's clearly um, uh, uh, but the, the joint collaboration of WHO and World Meteorological Organization are promoting weather and climate-based decision tools uh, in, uh, and particularly early warning forecasting. So this is a place for application of modeling 
And also, um, as uh, I think I mentioned uh, earlier on, the application in peacetime to modeling to better understand how to do uh, uh, interventions. And again, we've been doing this for quite some time. So um, I'll stop there and um, uh, I will just conclude by identifying that COVID-19 has been a golden age for modeling in public health. At least in part, that is because models in Canada have been recognized as being accurate and useful, but they've not in all cases been accurate and useful. And, uh, and that is um, uh, in all countries, that is, uh, which is worth, worth more exploration. COVID-19 is a poster child for emerging infectious disease that emerged due to environment, social land use change, including climate change. During COVID-19, we developed modeling tools to support decisions uh, uh, that are responsing to, re responsive to outbreaks arising from uh, emerging infectious diseases. And we uh, will continue to develop those um, and have them ready for work on endemic diseases, but also be able to pivot them to any further future um, uh, outbreaks and pandemics. Um, we have produced these model-based risk assessments and we will continue to uh, produce model-based risk assessments to get us uh, ahead of the curve in context, as much as we can in the context of climate and other uh, environmental and socioeconomic changes. And we will continue to, to work collaboratively on forecasting endemic infectious diseases um, and uh, support decisions on interventions such as booster campaigns. Obviously, we need knowledge, knowledge of the ecology, epidemiology and drivers of, of, of emerging infectious diseases. We need methods, um, uh, including the mathematical uh, uh, machine learning, and et cetera, et cetera. We need people who are subject matter specialist ex experts. We need mathematicians. We need epidemiologists. We need statisticians. Um, we need a whole range of, of experts, but we also need those people who are skilled in the multidisciplinary One Health approaches. So I'll end by thanking and congratulating the modeling community in Canada. The epidemic, the pandemic was a a hard, difficult period, uh, but it had some positive aspects too. And, and, and significance am, amongst that is how much the Canadian, mostly university-based modeling uh, people stepped up uh, uh, to the challenge, supported what we did um, and um, uh, um, uh, ending up being what I think uh, is an exemplary uh, um, uh, collaboration between public health and uh, and, and the um, uh, and, and academia. It what we need to do now is to look to the future, and uh, well, I recognise there is a lot of uncertainty uh, over the future of the in emerging infectious disease modelling. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, funding um, that uh, uh, certainly many people are working on this and uh, and so um, the need for an ongoing strong uh, uh, modeling community uh, in academia in Canada and within uh, public health uh, organizations such as our own that can collaborate um, uh, with the uh, with 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 university-based modelers uh, is uh, is well known and well understood, and uh, and so uh, I kind of with a certain caution, but I look forward to a uh, um, a, a, a positive uh, future and uh, a situation where we don't go back to where we were in terms of modeling preparedness pre-COVID-19. So I'll end there and um, ask if there are any questions. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful and informative presentation. Uh, 
Dr. Ogden. So we will now begin the question and answer session. So if you have questions, please raise your hands or type your question in the chat box. So we have already the business. Uh, there's a question. Did the COVID-19 models consider the financial, social costs of each intervention strategy? During the pandemic, how did the interventions get prioritized in terms of social economic cost? This question is from Azade Agi Ian. So with the, um, in the, a, uh, the um, retrospectively, the financial impacts are being explored. Um, uh, there are a number of, of projects that have been starting now to 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 assess, um, you know, what, how much would it have cost if we did that versus how much did it actually cost. So so those are un, those are under underway, but by and large it was so unprecedented that we didn't have any kind of like pre information to be able to to really understand the the the. Um, uh, uh, the the economic costs. Thank you. Uh, well, now I see. Yeah. Why would I? I guess I guess models in in other countries. I think it comes down to to the to the idea that that there were um, uh, uh, that there was a, um, a, a models that were not biologically realistic being try, trying to model biological realism. I think that was the main reason why why models were uh, uh, were were not accurate and, and not being updated. So uh, they were um, as knowledge emerged, they would remain doing parameterized as without being uh, being updated. and I think that was important. Okay, I uh, we have questions uh, in the chat box from Rebecca Tesson. So Rebecca, are you going to say it? He, he just answered that one. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, next question is from Martin. Uh, hi, Nick. Uh, Martin Meltzer from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control down in Atlanta. First, uh, thank you for uh, the wonderful presentation. Really enjoyed it. Uh, you mentioned a lot about accuracy, and, and my experience in modeling down here is that some people uh, really focus, and I'll use the word obsess about accuracy, that somehow a model that is, say, 89% accurate is better than a model, say, 84% accurate, but there could be a huge difference between the two models and complexity and thus ease of explanation. So what is your opinion here's my question what is your opinion on how accurate do models have to be for public health officials to use them and find them useful thank you um i think they have to have that's a it's a it's a, it's a great question I, I think they have to have uh, a certain realism right they're not in, and it so they have to be anchored somehow in in realism it depends on the question um, if you are uh, deciding what to do um, uh, uh, with interventions uh, and expecting that if you do X, your hospital capacity is, um, is not exceeded, and if you do Y, it is, then you need a certain amount of, of, of accuracy uh, in terms of uh, Am I talking precision or accuracy? Sometimes I get confused between the two. That uh, you have to have a a, um, a model which is which is going to say that if you do X, you will be okay. Um, that's that's okay if you have confidence um, in those models. And we did develop enough confidence that the models were uh, uh, able to do that with the, the, the amount of data that we had uh, available to us. Um, uh, that was um, a, um, 
a, 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 at that time and place, we could do it. But that's not to, to say that without that degree of, uh, of accuracy that the, um, the modeling is not useful because it's certainly capable of saying doing X is better than doing Y. Um, and without a model, in many cases, you may not be able to, 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 to assess that. So it depends on the purpose, I think, is the answer to that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Nick. So I see uh, Pei Yuan, Dr. Pei Yuan. Um, hi, Nick. Um, okay. Thank you for your informative uh, talk. So which gives us a full picture how the modeling can help from the public health point of view. So my question is, what, how do different types of modeling approach differ in their ability to support the public health decision making? So there are, are there the certain approach are more effective for certain type of disease or situations? And another question is like, um, what are the some of the key challenges and opportunities associated with using modeling to inform the public health decision making in the context of the post pandemic of the COVID-19? Thank you. So um, I think by that's that that's a, a huge question. Should we as have we got uh, have we have, have, have we got a, a, a full week to go over? <laughs> it's good. The, the, what models are applied to what situations is um, and it is something that we are exploring right now. In other words, so that we've got a suite of models that are, are or, or, or at least modeling platforms that can be pivoted and applied to different things. But you wouldn't necessarily use the, the, the you know, there's not one model that is perfect for everything. So, um, uh, so there are, uh, um, uh, it, it's a, it's a big, <laughs> it, 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 it's it's a big question, the, uh, uh, and maybe a an subject of another talk. Um, you, the second question that you had, what was that again? Just remind me. Yeah, it's for the opportunities and the challenges in the modeling, like to help for the public health in the post pandemic. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, I think you know, as I mentioned, it's been a golden age. And people have recognized the value of modeling. And I know people, there is also a community who say, I, I do not, uh, you know, well, modeling is a load of rubbish and so on. But but uh, but it, I think most people would recognize that it was it's been an exceedingly useful tool in guiding decisions. Um, uh, so it means that there is an opportunity. People listen to what modeling is doing, and that's a, that's a huge opportunity. Um, uh, challenges. I think. I think data uh, are the the challenges, and I think we have to recognise that modelling is uh, uh, is only as good as the the data. And maybe something that I haven't identified here is the use of modelling as a kind of a test bench, an experimental tool to for us to identify. Well, what are the factors in this transmission cycle, in this um, disease spread uh, 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 situation? What are those the, the, that are the, the most influential? Um, and therefore, what are, it, what are the pieces of data that we may not have that we really have to go in and, and, and get to? So in other words, modeling becomes a collaboration, not necessarily in a one health way, but also across different disciplines. So people doing studies in human behavior, studies doing of uh, you know field studies for vectors and uh, and uh, reservoir hosts laboratory studies etc so uh, it 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 you know it getting the information is a challenge but it's also an opportunity for a more collaborative work and for modeling to be brought um uh, into that 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 uh, that that collaboration thank you yeah, Nick, if you, uh, so we have another Martin has question in the chat box. How do you see the usefulness and accuracy visibility? I think Martin asked that question. Oh, yeah, oh, that is, an, okay. 
And then we have another question, one one kata from uh, PHO and the uh, University of Toronto. Hi, 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 Pin, how are you? Uh, hi, Nick, it is, it's the uh, nice meeting is here. Yeah, how are you? A uh, very long time meeting. So very, very insightful talk on the modeling. Uh, my question is that, uh, how do you see the different data types like you know, WGS being a, a, a key data set during this SARS time? And also phylodynamics is another modeling approach uh, has been, you know, it's like mostly the researchers like uh, academicians are using mostly not at, at currently at the public health agencies, right? How do you see that the use of I, the WGS and phylodynamics? I think I think it has been uh, a, uh, a a really interesting exploration uh, uh, of 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 the 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 use of whole genome sequencing and its uh, um, application in a uh, as as an, an epidemiological tool that is that goes beyond what it, how it started off maybe as 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 merely a, a very detailed and precise. Uh, identification of a bug uh, and the I being able to identify that this bug found here is the same as this one found there um, uh, for source attribution and uh, and, 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 and identifying uh, uh, clusters of cases and outbreaks to the idea that the the, the genome uh, uh, holds a whole lot of information that is that goes beyond that and particularly in terms you know in a phylogenetics way that the the phylogenetic tree is a history of the epidemiology um, uh, and uh, and that that suddenly allows you to 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 look at that and 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 think well uh, boy suddenly we've got a, a whole new um, uh, uh, opportunity for for using this information but it's interesting to see the the scale of whole genome sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 was pretty unprecedented um, and uh, and so when we um, uh, uh, when we start to look at alternative uh, um, uh, alternative methods of uh, or alternative uh, pathogens, we find that actually we, there has not near, been nearly enough and it, uh, and the uh, uh, study of them and the, again it's a great opportunity to learn what we have from COVID for. Uh, a, a, uh, whole analysis of whole genomes and phylogenomic approaches. Yeah, thank you, Nick. Yeah, the, the major problem what I'm seeing is the sampling sampling issues mostly associated with this genomic sequencing. Like as you said, SARS actually gave us a huge data sets like genome data sets. Maybe we could use that potentially to develop phylogenomic models to understand, I think. Yeah. Yes, it is. Indeed. Thank you, Nick. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, Nick, this Martin is another Martin. Martin, our oh, sorry, apart. So, uh, Martin, can you just speak out to, to save time? <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, so, my question really is um, modeling in a in a sort of peacetime environment um, to support prevention. And surveillance versus modeling um, in a response uh, scenario, trying to predict the uh, trajectory and <clears throat> probably efficiency of measures. Um, how do you see the usefulness, and what what are <clears throat> sort of the limiting factors, especially for modeling to support the active environment? Yeah, I think I, I go back to to the. Um, to to our experience in the that as long as the models are reasonably bi have bio biological realism and are parameterized uh, appropriately, they will provide uh, uh, information on which you can base uh, the design of, uh, of of interventions, and that could be happening in an outbreak situation. But it could also, it could also be something that you are uh, designing to control or reduce a, an endemic disease so it doesn't have to be applied just to just to outbreak situations um, uh, and um, so i, I um, it 
at, at, the, at the end of the day, the modeling has proved its worth. So um, uh, we don't we don't have to constantly be trying to justify it right now. So again, that is probably a bit of a positive out of um, out of the work we've done on on vector borne diseases previously, but also reinforced very strongly by um, what happened in COVID nineteen. So Perfect. did I answer your question? Yeah, that that really helps. Like. Uh, it um, it is a very positive outlook with regards to to yeah. uh, the value. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have another uh, a lot of questions. Now let's pick one from uh, Mortaza. Huh? Please go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nick. Uh, my question is regarding multidisciplinary approach uh, to modeling. Uh, what's your opinion to bring the the epidemiologic models into dynamic economic models, uh, uh, and uh, in that case, we can uh, even, um, in my opinion, we can evaluate the efficacy of the containment policies to control uh, disease. Yeah, uh, I, I'm interested to know that. Uh, do you support the, such a uh, uh, such researches. Uh, another question is that about the post uh, uh, crisis and uh, economic recovery risk. Personally, I'm interested and I have worked on the environmental risk of recovery. And do you support such issues uh, for post recovery risk? Thank you. Um, well, uh, the the application of modeling and the integration of modeling in, in, with other disciplines is uh, clearly something that uh, we are uh, we consider. So, you know, there there are um, uh, parameter values depend often on epidemiological studies. So, you know, the two are int intrinsically uh, related. And I have mentioned on a number of occasions that that effective modeling for public health of infectious diseases is not just a case of putting data and mathematics together. There has to be uh, a, a, an understanding of the biology of the system as well. And that, and, and that understanding of the biology of the system often comes from, from uh, an integration of, the, of, of knowledge, at least from other disciplines into the construction of the mathematical models. Um, and I'm not quite sure I understood about the recovery. Phase. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, post COVID recovery, economic recovery. Uh, personally, I work on the environmental risk and what happened when we get out of the recession, uh, yeah, results by the COVID and what will happen to the environment as uh, uh, in terms of the environmental pollution. Yeah. Uh, well, um, I mean, the, there's the um, the economic aspects are clearly something that that we did not have at our fingertips, but but you know again through the uh, emerging infectious disease modeling network, then we are uh, and kind of post hoc doing a lot more uh, uh, linkaging li linkage of uh, of mo of modeling of infectious disease outcomes with economics uh, behind it, and uh, so. That is a, a, a kind of a work in progress. Um, and uh, but the other thing that is a work in progress, and we have uh, worked particularly with uh, Huai Ping's team looking at the um, developing those models, which understand not only what's happening in the human population, but links explicitly with modeling what's happening in uh, uh, animal populations and the environment. So. Um, uh, that is uh, uh, something rec recognizing that, that SARS-CoV-2 is transmissible from human to human, but also remains as uh, a zoonosis and a, and a, a, a disease of, of, uh, of, of animals, wild and p p possibly uh, kind of semi-domesticated like rats. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. We have an earlier question from Herman. So Herman, can you just speak directly? So his question is, could you expand on the time and approximate 
cost of the creating forecasting models, of creating forecasting models? Uh, probably not. <laughs> um, I, well, I think I think it took. You know, this is good. I, 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 going from from where we were was, which was kind of point zero, nothing, to actually having a forecasting model. Uh, I guess probably took about six months, but maybe others on the call uh, today might um, uh, be. Uh, um, uh, um, kind of correct me there, but I think that was about the time it took it, it from the idea to Dr. Tam presenting it, if you see what I mean. But the, the cost, uh, I honestly couldn't put a do an accurate dollar value on that right now, but probably with a bit of, uh, bit of looking back, I could. But I think it, it would be within a, you know, sort of reasonably within what you'd expect of a, of a kind of uh, a, a, a moderate grant to a university, to an academic group, if you see what I mean, something like that for a postdoc. So we have uh, a question. Uh, Jewish, please go ahead. Oh, thank you, uh, Thank you, Nick, for the presentation, for the amazing presentation. Uh, I was wondering, uh, what do countries with low resources, low resources on public health, what do these countries, like what effort should they make to control these kind of pandemics and like in future, uh, what should their steps be? And what should the steps of the developed country should be in like, for towards these countries how should because like diseases spread from these countries to here and yeah yeah i think that uh thanks thanks for that and thanks for the the, the reminder I mean, emerging it, emerging diseases are a global problem and kind of um, we're, we're all in it uh, and so there is um a, there is clearly a need for there to be sharing of resources that, and uh, and and enable it, the 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 um, the uh, higher income countries are uh, uh, our need to support lower and middle income countries in their efforts. Uh, one thing that was clear uh, out of uh, out of the pandemic is that if you don't, then you know, you end up in trouble. So uh, I, that's my opinion. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So we have a question in the chat from Dominic, who is uh, starting PhD. Go ahead. Uh, Dominic, he is asking, if the modeling works, you've been involved in took account of the population's contact structure. Yes, it did. The, the, um, uh, the, the agent based model, the um, uh, uh, SEIR model, the R based model uh, used the, the contact matrices. There's a bit of a debate about to what extent are, are those accurate? Um, uh, the um, uh, and uh, but, and I think that it is a, uh, um, uh, a, a, and I've discussed this with a number of people in university in, uh, uh, departments, the, the idea that, uh, that we probably really need some updated uh, contact matrices for uh, the Canadian population and particularly maybe for uh, Canadian subpopulations recognizing that, that that there is quite a diversity in different environments across the country. So um, yeah, uh, it, it's clear that that if if you don't take that into account, you're going to end up with a model that is uh, it, it may at the end of the day be roughly accurate in terms of, of, of numbers, but it may not be in particularly in terms of the speed. Uh, of, uh, of uh, which diseases move through populations.
Thank you. We have a question from a colleague, Professor Zhigui Lin from China. Zhigui, are you asked a question yourself? Yeah. Uh, it's the last talk. Thanks. My question is how to balance the control of pandemic and uh, economic uh, development? Well, it's a big question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, I, I, <laughs> pass. <laughs> I, I think I think uh, the um, uh, uh, going forward, uh, there is going to be a, a, in an endemic situation. Um, uh, economics has to play a part in the decision making process. Um, in the face of uh, uh, a, a pandemic where we know that, as I mentioned, the population is uh, um, is 100% naive and we have zero therapies, zero vaccines, um, then you kind of, the, the non-pharmaceutical in interventions have to be uh, uh, trump uh, anything else because uh, the possible economic consequences are uh, are huge but clearly to be able to do that in advance would be uh, worth worthwhile but to what extent is economics the only arbiter it may be the right thing to do in for a particular population, even if it costs to do X, even if it costs more ultimately than Y in dollar terms. So that's a, it's quite a complicated question. That's maybe not a clear modeling answer. Uh, thank you, Nick. I'm oh, sorry, thank you, Zigui. So we have a, uh... One question from Sanas. Sanas, go ahead. Uh, good evening. Oh, sorry. Good morning. I'm I'm participating from Italy. <laughs> I sorry. I didn't I really didn't want to miss this thought. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to know how public health modeling and these researches uh, cover human awareness. For the case of uh, such as Lyme and COVID nineteen, um, you know, human the, awareness. How this modeling covers human awareness? We we're not actually using directly modeling approaches for 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 that in a mathematical way, but we are into in, uh, uh, taking that into a, into account. I think you know there's a a deeper a uh, uh, issue behind the question that you raised, which is that, and, and uh, often it's an aspect of one health where we think we've got humans aspects covered off when actually we don't. That the, the, um, uh, there are uh, uh, socioeconomic determinants of infectious disease uh, risk and sensitivities that we're not taking into consideration and that includes you know the range from sort of uh, uh people who are uh, um what's the word for it uh, uh, uh disadvantaged are uh, often have poorer diets uh, may have uh, more likely to have chronic disease um uh, which makes the outcomes of infectious disease worse they may not have the same access to uh, uh, to um, knowledge about prevention, to knowledge of perception of risk and, and the, the, you know, what the, the seriousness of diseases. And all of these are compounded and often not taken into consideration. I think it's, it's um, uh, but, but we are starting to do this in a more meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. We are getting to the end. Now we have one question from Benjamin, who in fact is a program manager from our browser uh, network, MFPH. Go ahead. 
Yes, uh, first, great talk, Nick. Uh, and you had mentioned at the, the end of your talk that you were looking for people who are you know, subject matter specialist experts and people who are skilled in multidisciplinary multi approaches. And my question was more where you see, you know, the government and agencies, institutions expanding and providing jobs for people within the networks. Well, I think that that um, uh, that we we hope we will expand that there will be uh, uh, that, that you know as you point out if the, the the development of highly qualified personnel is a really important part of the networks and that uh, there is no point in developing highly qualified personnel if they've got any jobs to go to um, but I think there has been a recognition of the need for uh, for, for modeling skill in uh, provinces and territories and in the the, the federal government so uh, I think we're in a much healthier place than we've been for a long time time in order to be a receptive environment as well as academic jobs for uh, to, as a as a place for people to to have a career and I think it's a it's a um, a uh, we, one of the additional advantages of COVID-19 was the the idea that we were able to hire some very talented people um, and that they maintain that continuum of thought and engagement and collaboration from the academic through to the policy in the in the agency so and without that con continuity and without people in the aid you know in public health organizations understanding modeling and being able to 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 take it and use it and collaborate together then it will lose its uh um it, its its purpose and its the the recognition of its usefulness yeah thank you okay thank you it's two minutes over time in fact it's a, a long presentation and question period thank you uh again dr nickton uh for the presentation also thank you all for attending this uh lecture please keep an eye on our future lectures uh so we will we hope you will join us again thank you all and take care bye-bye thank you